sometimes you do an x-ray you do an x-ray and sometimes you don't see some pathologies that may present and patient may let may 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 be allowed to go because of uh, the appearance of an x-ray so i'll try to stress and explain some few technicalities that needs to be understood regarding the musculoskeletal and the, some of the points that I'll bring out, there are general concepts that needs to be taken note of. It's also very important to note that the musculoskeletal ultrasound, it's a specialty in the ultrasound. Others, we are doing it, others are not doing it. But all in all, I think I will stress to bring out some few things that are so pertinent. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, I'm Lenga Cuthbert. I'm a radiographer, uh, but I'm specialized in ultrasound. I hold a master's degree in diagnostic medical ultrasound with special interest in cardiovascular ultrasound and musculoskeletal. My objectives for today uh, as follows, I'll explain the brief anatomy of the elbow joint. I'll also explain the indications that may be so relevant to this joint. I'll also go further to explain the technique and the compartments of the elbow joint, which is so relevant. And then also try to explain some few common pathologies that are common regarding the, the elbow joint. And more importantly, I should also emphasize that uh, we also need to have a comprehensive understanding and thorough anatomy regarding the elbow joint so that the sonographic features may, may make sense. So we know what an elbow joint is. This is the joint that is found on the upper limb of, of the human being between the the forearm and the humerus. It is a synovial joint, which comprises of two separate elbow joints. Some literature will also tell you that it has the three separate joints. And these separate joints may involve the trochlear notch of the ulna and the trochlea of the humerus, which may be included within the joint. The head of the radius and the capitulum may also comprise the elbow joint. So it's very important to understand that this elbow joint may have, depending on what you are looking at or the literature that you may come across, it may be described as to have the two separate joints or three separate joints. I'll explain and demonstrate how you can look at that. It is also very important to note that the proximal radio ulna joint is found within the same joint and it's encapsulated within the joint. But the key joint that you must understand is that this synovial joint of the elbow joint, it has got specific structures that needs to be che checked. And if not well assessed, you may miss quite a number of pathologies that may present. So like I mentioned, the elbow joint has prominent and specific features. And one of the prominent features that it has is that it has a recess around the colonoid and the radial fossa anteriorly. And within the ocranion fossa posteriorly, you can also find that there are some specific features like the ocranion bursa, which I'll still demonstrate on the normal ultrasound anatomy. And within each joint that we described, there exists an intracapsular and extra synovial fat pad. Why am I mentioning these fat pads? In in, in times of, in situations where you have trauma, these fat pads may be displaced and you may find it to be displaced from their normal anatomical location. So it's very important to understand and have a thorough understanding of each and every component that comes into play. The joint also has a capsule within the elbow, which is strengthened by ligaments, medially and laterally. And I should also mention here that uh, when you talk about the medial portion of the elbow joint, it is stabilized by the ulnar collateral ligament. And this ulnar collateral ligament, it has got its components now. And the components of the ulnar collateral ligament, they are basically three. They are very important to note 
we've got the posterior band, I'll show you. You also have the anterior band and the oblique band. These bands are very important when you come to the medial, medial stabilization of the elbow joint. The collateral ligament also, the, the ulna, or rather the radio ulna collateral ligament stabilizes the lateral portion of the elbow joint. It has also its complexes. And one of the major complexes that it has, it has the annular ligament and some other small accessory ligaments. I won't go deeper into their specific anatomical structures, but what is key is to understand that the elbow joint has got two many stabilizing ligaments, the medial collateral ligaments and the lateral collateral ligament. And their specific names has to be known so that even as you describe your, your components, it's very thorough. So the medial collateral ligament is basically the ulnar collateral ligament with their three specific components, which is the posterior, the anterior, and the oblique. While the lateral compartment has got lateral stabilization, has got this radio ulnar collateral ligament with too many collateral ligaments, which are the annular ligament and the accessory radio ulnar ligament. The medial elbow, like I've mentioned, is a collateral ligament and the lateral one is stabilized by the radio collateral ligament. So why am I emphasizing on this stabilization? It's because these are the main structures that may be involved when there is a tear, when there is involvement within the, the complete or the partial tear, and we must understand their compartments even as they come into play. So this one that you see here, this is the medial anterior band. This is the medial portion of the elbow joint. And these bands are very important because they help in the stabilization of this joint. We've got this band. This is the posterior band and we've got the oblique band. Why are we still mentioning this? You also realize that the medial portion or the medial compartment, medially, it has got other compartments which we can call the common flexor tendon. Now, this common flexor tendon around the medial portion, it's very, very important clinically when a patient comes with an injury and they are unable to flex their elbow joint. It must click as a sonographer or as a radiographer doing that, that there must be something happening within the radio, the, the, the medial compartment. Why? The medial compartment, it has got the common flexor tendon and it's always affected when it comes to pathologies. While the lateral compartment, it is also, it tends to have this compartment which comes with its own complications. And then it has got the common extensor tendon. So on the lateral portion, it's the common extent tendon. So the lateral portion of the elbow has to do with the extension, while the medial portion has to do with the flexion portion. This is very important and crucial when it comes to clinical assessment, because you are able to tell exactly which part of the portion is involved. For example, if the elbow joint cannot completely extend and the patient when they extend they are having pain within the elbow joint it must click that most likely we are dealing with the traumatic or injured or lesions within the lateral portion of the elbow so it's very important to understand these components that are within here i'll try to explain also on the posterior portion the posterior portion also we've got the triceps the triceps this is a muscle again that comes to insert on the occlusion, and this insertion, remember, the muscle is attached to a bone by a tendon. A tendon attaches the muscle to a bone. So posteriorly, mostly you have the triceps, which comes on the distal portion of the humerus, and it extends until it inserts, okay, on the or cranial process is just posteriorly here. And just above, just above the cranial process, you've got a bursa. So that is also very important. This bursa may inflame, it can ir be irritated depending on the traumatic that may come into play. 
So this can also help you to understand exactly what is going on there. But the key issue is to understand that posteriorly, you've got the triceps, which is connected to the Oclanion process by the brachia, brachy, brachy tendon, which comes just behind here. Anteriorly, again, you also have to understand that there are two major structures that needs to be explained. So you find that on the anterior portion, you've got the biceps brachia and you've got the biceps brachialis. Now these two, they tend to crisscross. The biceps brachialis, it tends to come and insert on the ulnar portion medially. While the brachialis, it tends to come and insert on the radius portion laterally. So by this crisscrossing that tends to happen between the two anteriorly, they tend to reinforce still the elbow joint. Why am I mentioning these things? Because they are very important sonographically when you have a partial tear, complete tear, or even when you have uh, a, a sprain, which may also affect this joint. Sometimes you also have to understand that this joint can also be affected by, by some particular diseases which may involve specifically the nerves. So this is where you have the radio nerve. Sometimes you can also have the vasculature that can be affected within the joint. Things like uh, the brachial artery can be affected. And then, so this complexity that we are discussing here has to be known. And in the background of our mind, we must understand that the effect that may come into play may also help in, in the diagnosis of uh, some lesions that may occur. Uh, or the proximal, the distal portion of the humerus, you've got the lateral epicondyle and the medial epicondyle. I should mention here that uh, the medial epicondyle, sometimes you can have uh, the epitrochlear lymph node. This epi epitrochlear lymph node may enlarge. I'll still explain again how you can tell that this epitrochlear lymph node has enlarged. And sometimes solid masses within the, the medial portion of the elbow joint may also not be specific. But once you have an idea that you are dealing and that this anatomical region, you have the, the trochlear lymph node, at least it's going to give you a room to concentrate on what exactly you are looking at. So this is what I, I was trying to explain. I think anterior to the elbow joint is the brachialis. Okay, it's very important that as you approach the anterior portion, you have to know that the brachialis inserts on the ulna and the biceps brachy tendon inserts on the radial tuberosity. So they tend to crisscross each other and the, anatomically, they reinforce the elbow joint. These two structures are very crucial in understanding the elbow joint, and they tend to be involved in specific cases that may come. Posteriorly, the triceps brachy inserts on the Ukrainian process of the ulna, and make sure whenever you are doing this, this has to come into play that this Ukrainian process, just above it, you've got a bursa and fluid, bursitis may happen, and you can have that pathology that may come into play. Medially, I've already explained, the common flexor tendon consists of five muscles that may come into play. I won't discuss these muscles, but what is so crucial is that you must understand that on the medial portion, you've got the common flexor tendon that consists of five muscles, the flexor capi radialis, the palmalis longus, the flexor capi aunalis, and the flexor gidatorium. One crucial thing that you must understand is that the medial portion has to do with the flexion of the elbow joint, while the lateral aspect of the elbow joint has to do with the extensor portion of the elbow joint. Again, these are the, the lateral common extensor tendon that should be understood. It composes of all those five muscles that you can have, the extensor capi, radialis brevis, extensor digitatorium, extensor digital, menin, and all those. I know people, we have a lot of muscles around there and the tendons. I don't want to bore you to explain all these things. What is clear is to understand that these lateral portion has to deal with the extensor tendon 
of the elbow joint. And we also have to understand that we have the neurovasculature within the elbow joint. So the blood supply to the the blood supply to the elbow joint is basically from the arterial supply, which is the which comes from the anastomosis of the intercubital region. And this is where you also have to understand that sometimes you can have uh, pathologies that may affect specifically the, the vasculature and the, the neurovascular band. So that anatomy is also very key. And I should also mention here that uh, as you are trying to locate specific structures, the, for instance, the, the brachial artery can help you to locate specific muscles like the biceps brachii. It can also be helped. So having an understanding and the background information on a, a specific vessel, it's very key because it can help you to locate. Each nerve supply is from the median musculoscutaneous and the radial nerve anteriorly and the ulnar nerve posteriorly. Why am I mentioning about the nerves and the supply? Patients may be involved in traumatic situations and they may also be affected. You can see sometimes you can have lesions like tumors, which may affect these nerves that we are talking about. Tumors like uh, the peripheral nerve sheath tumors, they may also come into play, which I'll, I'll, I'll explain in the next slide. The median nerve is located medially to the brachial artery, like I mentioned, you can see that the brachial artery can, can also be help, help in location of the, the median nerve. And it causes distally between the ulna and the humeral heads. The radial nerve is located at the posterior aspect of the humeral shaft. So these specific structures needs to be understood. Uh, just to explain and show some few things that I've already explained. Uh, this is the anterior portion of the, of, of, the, of the elbow joint. As you do your ultrasound, make sure that you understand where the capitulum is. The capitulum is just adjacent to the radius and the radius is just lateral to the, is a lateral bone on the forearm. And then immediately you've got the ulna and the ulna, the ulna head is in contact with the trochlea. And posteriorly, this is the oclenion that you can see, and then just anterior to the oclenion, or just anterior to the oclenion, you are going to have the oclenion bursa. That information is very key. Again, I just want to demonstrate what I've already explained. Uh, this is our triceps. I've already explained this, this tendon, uh, which is posteriorly and attaches to the oclenion. The biceps here, you've got the biceps brachii, it comes to insert on the radius anteriorly, and then you've got on the lateral portion, on the medial portion, you've got this radialis brachii, which comes to hold in the ulnar portion. Again, this is just for the nerve, the ulnar nerve. Uh, I was trying to demonstrate the ulnar nerve and their relationship with each other, the medial epicondyle and the lateral epicondyle of the, the distal portion of the humerus. Sorry, I'm, I'm having a feedback. Even quiet. Maybe. Thank you. So on this image, I was just trying to just illustrate exactly what we are dealing with. And you know exactly, this is the posterior portion of the elbow joint. You can see still the Euclidean process is posteriorly. And then you've got those images that may come into play. Uh, what are the indications for elbow joint? So having explained some few anatomies of uh, the elbow joint, you also have to be very systematic and understand each and every indication because specific indication may, may affect specific um, anatomical structures. You've got subcutaneous bursitis. This may come due to irritation of the joint and uh, you can have specific areas that may inflame. And uh, you also have to go have a good thorough clinical history of the patient. And I should also mention here that uh, when you are doing an elbow joint, sometimes you can be focused on the patient's body part. And sometimes uh, the body part may be so symptomatic that you even know exactly where the pain is. But what is key is to have a comprehensive assessment 
or rather evaluation of the joint so that you can have the, 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 the whole anatomical structure has been assessed. You can have uh, the sub tendinosus bursitis, and this also may specifically affect the tendons. I've already explained some of the tendons that may be affected, like the common extensor tendon, okay, on the lateral portion, and the common extens common flexor tendon on the medial portion. So these are some of the things that you may come into play, and you can you can have specific assessment or rather evaluation of these. Ligaments may also be involved. So you have to know exactly, am I dealing with the ligament? Am I dealing with the tendon? Am I dealing with the, the nerve sheath problem? Or what is it exactly that I'm, I'm dealing with? What are the major ligaments abnormalities that we are talking about? Earlier on, I explained about the medial collateral ligament, which is the ulnar collateral ligament, and the radio collateral ligament with their complexities and their components in each. You can have specifically pathologies that may affect the tendon and the muscle. Uh, in my practice, I should also mention there that I've seen ruptured the distal portion of the, of the biceps. I've also seen the triceps in, in a patient who came, uh, I think he's a rugby, rugby player and, uh, and the short put. So these things, they are common, you can have them. So specifically, you must understand, am I dealing with a tendon abnormality or a muscle? And as long as you don't have a good comprehensive understanding of each and every anatomical structure, you are likely to miss. Am I dealing with the peripheral nerve lesions like tumors? Are they cystic? Are they solid? If they are solid, are they benign? Are they malignant? You may not really diagnose or give a specific diagnosis, but at least with ultrasound, you can apply your color flow. You can look at the distortion of the adjacent structures and check some few things that may give you a clue and at least give some differentials within there. You can also have cases like epitrochlear lymph node. This is one of the common indications also for those who are practicing musculoskeletal ultrasound, you may also find it. And it can be diagonized nicely with ultrasound. What is the technique? In all musculoskeletal ultrasound, we use high frequency probe. Uh, we don't need to explain what a high frequency probe. We are dealing with superficial structures and we want high resolution. A patient may be examined in supine or in sitting position. But in my opinion, I prefer to scan the patient in a sitting position and you put the, air, the, the elbow joint on the table and you do the maneuvers. So the technique is very simple. And uh, what are some of the general comments that I want to make before I go into the practical? The elbow ultrasound examination may be completed with the patient in the sitting position or patient may lie. The elbow joint can be placed. You, you place the elbow joint on the examination table and you do your maneuvers, the anterior, the lateral, the posterior and the medial. Evaluation of the elbow joint may be focused or that is relevant to a patient history, or you may do a comprehensive assessment of the elbow joint. Comprehensive examination should always be considered for proper assessment and diagnosis of the elbow abnormalities. If you are just doing things haphazardly, you put your probe on the lateral, you come on the posterior, you check here, to some extent, you may not do a proper job. So the emphasis is to be systematic, methodical, and look for each and every lesion in each specific compartment. So, you start with your anterior compartment. What are the specific structures that you need to check? You don't need to check for everything. You can check for brachialis. You can check for biceps brachii. You can check for the median nerve and check for the anterior joint recess. The brachialis, it's a muscle. The question is, you need to understand where is the muscle inserting? From what portion to what portion? A muscle doesn't insert itself to a bone. You need a tendon. A tendon attaches a muscle to a bone. The question is, do you know how a tendon appears on scan? The biceps, brachii, this is also another structure that you need to check. 
the median nerve, you need to know how does a nerve appears on ultrasound? How does a normal nerve appears on this? And then these anterior joint recesses, I explained, it's a potential space where fluid may accumulate. Things like joint effusion, things like uh, abscess, you can also abscess within the joint, but you must understand within the anterior compartment, we've got this uh, recess that may come into play. So you've got specifically four things that you look at. I should mention here that we differ, protocols may differ depending on the department that you are working on, but at least you can evaluate these, these structures within the elbow joint and you concentrate on others. So the elbow joint is extended and the end is in it, supine. So simple, the patient may be seated, you put your elbow joint in supine on the table. You just have to reassure the patient, you talk to the patient, explain exactly what you need to do so that the maneuvers that you are taking, they are so appropriate. So the patient extends the elbow joint, whether the patient is sitting or the patient is sleeping, it still works. Orientation of the probe, very important. We still use the same principle of the pointer, of the marker of the probe, and you put, you start with transverse. So when you locate the brachial artery, medially, now how do you tell I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with the brachial artery? You use color Doppler. Color Doppler helps you to locate. So you are, one thing that you are going to see, you are going to, you go in the medial aspect of it. You are going to see the flow. You can also, if you want to believe that you are dealing with the, with the, with, with the artery, you can put your post. Quickly, you put your post and check if really you are dealing with the artery. Now, the brachial artery will help you to know that you are in the medial portion of the elbow joint. And deep in the midline, is a brachialis muscle. This brachialis muscle is immediately and adjacent to the distal humerus. So you are going to find the brachial artery anterior and just below the brachial artery, you are going to find the brachialis. And within the brachialis compartment, you are going to find that there will be a tendon that is attaching this brachialis medially to the ulnar portion. And pathologies within there can also be noted. I'm going to explain how you can pick that one. But the key picture is that as you orient your probe, locate the brachial artery medially using color, and then deep in the midline, you're going to find the brachialis muscle. So this is what I'm trying to explain. Uh, I should also mention that sometimes you can start in the mid, right in the mid joint, and then you go slightly proximal, sorry, prox distal to proximal, and you can see some specific structures. Uh, you have to forgive me, I think my, my images is not very clear, but uh, once you pick this, when you look at this, this is the brachial artery in an elbow joint. So for you to pick the brachial artery, you have to slightly move proximal from the joint. I mean, you go proximal, to, to, the, to, the, to the humerus. So you go slightly up and uh, remember there are variants also. You can go slightly up or just some few one to two centimeters above the elbow joint, but this is what you need to expect. So when you look at this A, my concentration here is this A. This is the brachial artery. Now this gives you a sign that you, this is the medial portion, this is the lateral portion. And if this is the lateral portion, it also makes sense to start now identifying the structures. These structures here can only be, can only be appreciated if you understand the anatomy. As long as the anatomy is not comprehensive, you are going to miss things. Now, just anti, just posterior, just posterior, to the brachial artery, you are going to have the nerve here. Sorry, you still have to forgive me. The nerve, the, the images are not clear. But what I'm trying to explain is specific structures, they will help you to know specific structures adjacent to them. So this is this is the radial nerve, which is adjacent and it's more on the me on the on the lateral portion. Sorry, 
this is the outer nerve and then you've got another nerve here on the on the on the medial portion of it so basically this particular image has to help you to understand specific structures the brachial artery there is a nerve here there is a nerve here the nerve will give you this specific speckle appearance that you may find adjacent to each and every structure that you may want to scan. And you must also understand that the appearance of the joint, the hyaline cartilage, this echogenic line, the hyaline cartilage, must also be understood. It must be smooth. Okay, the contour must be very smooth. You may be dealing with the pathological conditions, things like uh, osteoarthritis. You can be dealing with the other irritative pathologies. This joint may also be increased on ultrasound. You may also see it. And once you understand specific anatomical structures, it's going to help you. I think I've got uh, nice images, so I'll, I'll, I'll still show you. I wanted to give this schematic uh, image so that at least as we do the, the the elbow joint, particularly on the anterior elbow joint, we have this in mind. So anteriorly, you can have, you have to imagine this uh, pyramid. Some people it helps, some people it doesn't help. So when you have this anteriorly with your patient facing you, the yellow portion, this yellow portion around here, these are the brachialis. Okay, so it has a longer head and a shorter head. They extend as they come from above here. They extend one here and then the other one there. Then you also have uh, these within the brachialis. You've got uh, the brachial radialis. Within there, they intertwine within the brachialis. And then uh, you've got this, the blue one, which is just here. Okay, it's a pronator telis. Uh, uh, which I'll, I'll explain, there is, there is a clinical relevance for that. And then uh, the white one here, like I mentioned, this is the radio nerve. How does a nerve appears on the scan? It gives you a speckle appearance. By the way, you need to have a very good machine for you to see some of these specific structures that we are talking about. And as long as you don't have that specific uh, and good high-end machines, you may not appreciate some of these things. I'll still come back to that and explain some few things. When you go to the medial portion or the medial compartment, specific structures must be noted. One of the things that you need to look at is the ulnar collateral ligament. I mentioned that the ulnar collateral ligament stabilizes the medial portion of the elbow. And it has got three components, the posterior, the medial, and the, uh, the anterior bands. These helps. And one of the things that you need to analyze is the ulnar collateral ligament, very specific. I also mentioned that the common flexor tendon, the medial portion of the elbow deals with the flexion aspect of the elbow. That has to be explained and has to be assessed. Remember, we are dealing with a tendon. A tendon attaches a muscle to a bone. So understand the relationship between, sonographic relationship between a muscle and a bone and a tendon. That is very key. The pronator teres has to also be understood. The ulnar nerve must also be assessed. You may be very surprised. Some people, they can also request specifically for you to check for the ulnar nerve. If you start doing things haphazardly, you are likely to mess up. So be systematic, be methodical, know exactly what you are assessing within the medial portion. Again, I'll still repeat, if your anatomy is not thorough, if you are not solid in the anatomy on the medial compartment, still you are going to miss things. How do you do it? There are methods that you can use. One of the methods is that you can let the patient extend they, are, they, are, they put their elbow like the way you can see on the, on the bed. The patient is still seated. Now, I, I like this part and sometimes I use it because it gives you room to see both the posterior, the lateral and the medial portion because you are able to put your probe 
on either sides. Posteriorly, you are able to check uh, the triceps and the ocline on this side. Medial, you can check, and lateral, you can check. So this is a simple portion, and the specific structures can be seen. And the, the major thing that you need to check, like when you look at this, this structure here that you are seeing here, this structure here, okay? We are dealing with, this is the ulnar collateral ligament. It's a main ligament that we check. It attaches a muscle, this muscle here, it is attached to a bone. So you need to check, is it thorough? And I should also mention here that in musculoskeletal ultrasound, always be aware of artifacts that may come into play. And the key and one of the major artifacts that we have is angiotropy. What is angiotropy? Angiotropy is an artifact that may come into, into musculoskeletal when the beam of ultrasound is not hitting the muscles at 90 degrees. This is very common in, in cases where you are having caved, caved structures and the, the, the beam is not hitting the, the specific structure at 90 degrees. How does it appear? It will give you an hypoechoic, like dark appearance around the structure. And this may be mistaken to an effusion or a tear or a rupture or a sprain. So how would you correct angiotropy? You can rock, rock until you ensure that uh, you, you are hitting the beam at 90 degrees uh, to the structure. So this is a ligament media that you specifically have to check and check the joints that may come into play. I have another image which will, will show you. Okay, this is the common, the common flexor tendon. Again, you can see how it is passing. And this is the medial epicondyl. Uh, we know that these epicondyls that we are discussing, they are just bone prominence from our anatomical portion. So you have to understand them. And this is where this, flexor tendon comes to attach. They attach to that uh, medial epicondyl. And once you don't appreciate the, the attachment and the insertion of the either the medial epicondyl or the lateral epicondyl, it may become a challenge. So the medial epicondyl, like I mentioned, this is where the common flexor tendon with those muscles, the bunches of muscles, there are about five or four muscles. They come, they, 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 it's a band of muscles and they come to insert, they come, they, they are inserted by the common flexor tendon medially on the distal portion of the humerus where the epicondyl is present. So they insert on the epicondyl of the humerus which is located on the distal portion. So what am I trying to emphasize here? I'm trying to emphasize the relationship of each particular tendon and the specific anatomical bone prominence. So here, your job is to check the common flexor tendon. Don't even start looking for other things. The question is, how does it appear? I'll show you some of the pathologies. Lateral elbow, what specific things do you look at? Uh, I mentioned again earlier on that the lateral elbow structures, one of the key major ligaments that you need to know, it's a radio collateral ligament. Radio collateral ligament. One of the major uh, physiological function that we, or the, the mechanical function is that this is where you find the common extensor tendon. The lateral portion deals with the extension of the elbow joint while the medial portion deals with the flexor portion of this joint. So you must understand if a patient comes with the hand just in, a, in an extended uh, or rather in the flexion position, but they cannot extend, don't even waste time. Try to evaluate particularly the lateral portion of the elbow joint. Why you understand the physiology of the common extensor tendon. And this common extensor tendon, it inserts on the lateral epicondyl of the humerus. So don't look at other things, go straight. How is the insertion of this tendon? Don't even look at the muscles because this is not your interest now. You want to see is the insertion okay? Why is the insertion okay? 
you have to know that there are bands of muscles that may come into play. Again, go and check the radio collateral ligament complex. I mentioned the radio collateral ligament complex, it has got two major components or complexes. Now, this remember, I mentioned that the radio collateral ligament, it stabilizes the lateral portion of the elbow joint. So its component, it's the annular ligament and the small accessory of the radio annular recess. Very, very important to note. I know I, you may get mixed up with these terms, but you need to be systematic so that you know specific things that you are looking at so that you can give at least something near to what you are looking at. Always check the capitulum. What is the capitulum? The capitulum is just the bone prominence that you may find within the elbow joint and it's more prominent on the lateral portion. Check it. You may have uh, bone lesions there. You may have osteoarthritis. Check the contour there. How is it looking? How is it appearing there? You can check for those things. Check for the radio nerve also in cases of uh, peripheral sheath uh, tumors, which can be benign or malignant. Check for it and see what is happening there. This is how you can position. I think you can see this is very simple. Uh, this patient was in supine, but you are trying to look at specifically the lateral portion. Please don't just check things. Look for specific things. The common extensor, the radio collateral ligament, and the rest. This is how you do it. And when you look at these specific things, you have to indicate and know that this, this thing that you are seeing here, this is the capitulum. This is the capitulum and this is the muscle and we are not checking the muscle. If you look at here, there is no muscle here. So don't concentrate on things that are not there. We want to check ligament and the ligament, how is it inserting and how is, this is the muscle that we are having here. And then you can also see this, this, this tendon. This is the extensor tendon, common extensor tendon coming to insert on the, on the, on the lateral epicondyle. So specific things can be checked and then look at the joint surface, uh, the joint space. Also look at the, the contour there. Is it regular? Is it irregular? And what is happening there? Do we have anything that is there? Posteriorly, what are specific things that you look at? You check for the posterior joint recess, and the triceps brachii, the oclenion bursa. And these are some of the things that you look at. I explained to say the oclenion bursa, this is just an anatomical structure that is found just above the oclenion process. And you may have fluid accumulation that may, may indicate bursitis. And the, I should also mention here that the, the bursa, a normal bursa, generally in muscle skeletal or in, in the body, they are, not, they are not easily seen, but once there is any fluid or any irritation of that bursa, you are likely to have fluid accumulation. What is the key thing here? You have to know exactly which specific bursa am I dealing with. One of the culprit bursas within the elbow joints is the, the ocranion bursa. Fluid normally accumulates there, there is bursitis there, and the triceps brachii, also has to be understood that it inserts the triceps posteriorly, it inserts from the, the triceps and then it goes and insert on the ocranion bus. The posterior recess, again, I mentioned these are just specific spaces where fluid may accumulate. How do you do it? You can do something like this. You can see that this specific joint is just particularly trying to assess the, 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 the posterior portion. But again, there is nothing wrong to use that portion, that, uh, that image that I gave you, where you can access the, the medial portion and the lateral portion. What is so crucial is to make sure that know exactly what you are looking at. So this is the ocranion, okay? And this is our, our, brachy, our triceps brachy. This is our triceps brachy. And the triceps brachy, this is the muscle which is there and then it will be attached to a tendon now, and then it comes to insert all the way up to there. So this is how the normal posterior compartment will look. And you are going to appreciate it as it comes and it folds 
around the Ukrainian. So the key issue is to understand at what level, at what point am I having this, this uh, triceps brachy and where is it exactly where it, it, it is passing? So the key structures that you need to check in the posterior compartment, it's this Ukrainian, understanding that this is where the triceps brachy inserts. I think this is very key. Always remember to scan your images or your structures at two orthogonal planes so that you can understand exactly what you are dealing with. Again, you can see here, this is the triceps tendon. It's also coming to inserts on the, on the, on the Ukrainian. So these striated lines are very important in muscle skeletal to, uh, to understand. The contour of the bone cartridge also, it's very key to understand and know whether you are dealing with the uh, bone involvement diseases, whether you are dealing with trauma, whether you are dealing with pathological or soft tissue injuries. You may do an elbow joint, the elbow looks okay, but the patient continues to complain. Pick a probe, try to check whatever you can pick there and guide clinicians so that the patient may benefit from such examinations. Uh, I just wanted to show some of the, the common pathologies that may come within the BASA. Um, I'm just from talking about the, the triceps, uh, the triceps brachy. So when, when you look at this, uh, this is the Ukrainian, because we know that the triceps brachy insets on the Ukrainian process. And just above the Ukrainian, you have the BASA, which I mentioned. So it may inflame. And as you can see sonographically here, you can see that this is the, not an acute, an acute uh, pathology. You can see those echogenic and cobalt stone-like appearance. It's a sign that this is a chronic inflammation. And uh, you can see it's clear that there's fluid within the bursa. And uh, you can help a patient here and the patient may be guided on that. Uh, this is also bursitis within the elbow joint, you can see. Still, this is our Ukrainian, and uh, just above it, you are having this, uh, this, uh, this uh, collection of basitis that may come within the basa. Uh, this is also basitis, chronic, chronic, chronic inflammation process that you can see there. Um, you can also see a tendon and a muscle abnormality. Okay, so you are losing that uh, nice striated appearance. So there is there is there is a there is a distortion within there. Be careful with anxiotropy. Anxiotropy may appear hypoechoic. So try to maneuver and and uh, correct your, your 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 beam so that you can pick exactly what is happening. So specifically, I wanted to show that within the band of the muscle or a tendon, you can have a rupture. I've seen quite a number of uh, ruptures, the, uh, things like the rectus femoris on the on the lower portion, on the on the on the thigh, uh, quite significant, and you can actually see the, the detachment and the detachment within the tendon and the muscle. Normally, you see the muscle and hypoechoic appearance. The question is, you really have to know exactly which portion and which structure are you looking at. Uh, I've been talking about things like peripheral nerve sheath tumors. Uh, these tumors may, may, may occur. Uh, it, it, it doesn't mean they only happen within the elbow. This is a general term. And the elbow can be one of the, the joints that may be affected with peripheral sheath tumors. So just to mention about what a peripheral sheath tumor is. So these may be malignant or they may also be B9 tumors. And the, the common ones, the common ones which you may experience uh, even after biopsy or even after other examination, it's a squamanoma. Squamanoma, it's one of the common that can affect the, the, the nerve sheath, the radio nerve that may be affected. You can have a tumor there. And the other one is a neurofibroma. Uh, these are, are, are can, they, they are B9 tumors, they are very common. So at least when you are doing a, an ultrasound of the elbow, when you happen to find things like this, uh, it can click in your mind and come up with uh, some of these things. So in, in these tumors, in most cases, the cancer cells that form the sheath that covers and protects the peripheral nerves. 
uh, when you go in literature, they will still explain things like uh, the most common people are prone to this. It's a genetical component. You can have people who are within this specific age and stuff like that. But the key issue is once you are scanning the, the elbow joint, you must understand that there are specific tumors that may come into play and they may present a solid or cystic with necrotic components within them. But your job is to guide clinicians and be aware that these things may come into play. And uh, they are more common with the genetic conditions like uh, neurofibromatosis type one. Uh, and when you see a lesion, please, when you see a lesion, don't rush to go to start naming and diagonizing. You can say it's a solid lesion, it's a cystic lesion, biops is advised or clinical coloration is advised so that you may guide the patient. Sometimes we mislead as the sonographers, we mislead clinicians and we, we write a lot of things. So once we check specific things, make sure that you guide clinicians even as you do your, 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 your reporting. Uh, we also have uh, phonographic features that may also come into play. Uh, and these masses, they may appear typically hypoechoic masses with low level internal echoes. Uh, for those of us who are practicing ultrasound, when we talk about low level internal echoes, uh, this is a situation where you can have uh, uh, a mass can be cystic. And if it's clear with clear fluid within inside, you cannot say it as low level internal echoes, but once you have those small echogenic debris within the, the, the mass, you can refer to them as low level internal echoes. Uh, you can also have increased flow on color Doppler. And uh, you agree with me that one of the hallmarks of uh, malignant lesions is that they are highly perfused, uh, sorry, they are highly vascularized. So there is no harm. Use your color Doppler, use your power Doppler, apply and check if there is, that lesion is highly vascularized and then try to guide. If malignant, they may also contain an echoic cystic or necrotic areas. And this may also be confirmed only on histology after a biopsy is recommended. What am I trying to say here? Make sure that you look for specific things apply specific modalities, things like color Doppler, power Doppler, and when and how to apply them, it must also be appropriate. Understand and adjust your, your color scale so that you get specific things on that particular uh, lesion that you're looking at. And then don't rush to go for name, name giving of the diagnosis. Describe if things are so specific and then recommend for other investigations to be done. This is how a peripheral nerve sheath may, may appear on, a, on an elbow. You can see that it's a superficial and a, a subcutaneous, subcutaneous a, a lesion. This is solid, as you can see, and the, it's, it's within the sheath, the nerve sheath. If you understand the anatomical, uh, anatomical pattern of the sheath, you find that the nerve sheath is, is, is within the, 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 the muscular and the neurovascular anatomical structure. So it may, it may actually distort that normal striated portion. So you may have a lesion like this within the elbow joint. Don't underlet it and don't overdiagonize uh, over it. Apply your color, measure it, recommend for a biopsy and wait for histology. And then you conclude, very important, uh, you can have things like a, a peripheral nerve sheath tumor, which may present as a cyst. You can see this looks cystic, and you may not know this may be a malignant, or it may be a benign. What are you supposed to do? You can biopsy this and then guide clinicians so that they know exactly what is going on. These are some of the, 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 the tumors again that you may find. So this was on the, on the, on the, on the triceps muscle uh, in transverse. And then you can see that it's, it's well embedded within the sheath, the peripheral nerve sheath. And still, you can still see that uh, there is a lesion there that is seated within the, in the, the sheath. Uh, I also wanted to take advantage to talk about the, uh, 
the normal lymph node. I know this is not what we are discussing, but at least uh, these are some of the things that you may come across. So the general tips or the general principles when you are dealing with the, with the, with, with the nodes, and the reason why I'm talking about this because I mentioned about the epitrochlear uh, lymph node. So I need also to explain how you can tell this is a normal lymph node and this is how it appears when it's like this, this is what it means. So typically in the body, a normal lymph node is over in size and it has got specific anatomical appearance. And one of the anatomical appearance is that it has an echogenic central hilum. Very important to note that. On top of that, around this hilum, you also have an hyperechoic rim. Now, this hyperecho this echogenic central limb, you need to understand why does it appear centrally. Normally, this is due to the to the fat uh, fatty tissues that are within there and the sinusoid. And remember, a fat typically in its context, it's hypoechoic. But because it's a fat tissue that is there, there is increased echogenicity within the, the node. So that node within, within, the, within the, the, the sinus node, within the, the lymph node, it will give you that echogenic appearance that we see. And around it, you are going to see an hyperechoic rim. And just within outside the, outside the, the, the central hilum, you are going to have the hypoechoic appearance. And this is where when you want to check if there is flow and the, the vascularity of the lymph, remember the lymph has got it, the vascular and it's well perfused. So you are going to see the perfusion within there. And you're not going to see perfusion within the central hilum. And this is very important. And this is a general principle that applies to all lymph nodes. Now, there is a knot here. When a lymph node is enlarged, but it maintains an oval shape and normal echogenic hilum and the hilar vascular pattern, you have to start thinking of the hyperplasia from inflammation. I've seen people talking about lymphadenitis, lymphadenopathy. Sometimes we interchange or we mix them, but we comment on such. But what is key is that when there is, and typically when there is, a, when there is a, an inflammation or there is, there is an injury to the body, depending on we, where the injury is, you all agree with me that you are going to have things like reactive lymphadenopathy, where the lymph node may enlarge, but it's, it, it's, it's just reacting to the adjacent injury. Remember, anatomically, the lymph node is, 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 plays a major role in the, in the immune system. So it's just trying to respond. So that response may also affect, it may make the lymph node to enlarge, but it will maintain its shape, its echogenic hilum, and the, the pattern within the vascular pattern, it will be normal. And other things may also happen if you have a tumor or if you have a, a lesion within the, the lymph node, it will distort that shape. So what am I trying to say? Reactive lymphadenopathy, yes, a lymph node will enlarge. It may tend to be abnormal in size, but the vasculature, the hilum, the echogenic hilum, and the vascular system, they will remain the same. So you have to start thinking of things like inflammation process. It may be due to inflammation that may be going on there. This is the typical features of a lymph node. Uh, this is the echogenic central hilum that I was talking about. This is normal. And this is the hyperechoic, sorry, hypoechoic region within the lymph node. And this is where you apply your color. You see the color flow and what is happening here. And this is the hyperechoic rim that I was talking about. So this is normal. And typically it will give you this, this oval shaped, that is it. Sometimes this lymph node appearance anatomical structure may be distorted. So we come to epitrochlear lymph node. Now, this is a lymph node that you may find within the medial aspect of the elbow joint. So how do I deal with this? 
I know it exists. I know it is there. So how do I tell? Sometimes the solid masses within the elbow joint may not be specific. And why do I say may not be specific? You, you, can, you can have different lesions that may come into play. But in the back of your mind as a sonographer, always be aware that we've got a, an epitrochlear lymph node. Sometimes you may see it to be normal. Sometimes you may see it as a distorted lesion. So what do you do? An enlarged lymph node is round, like we said, with an absence of an echogenic hilum, thickening of an epochaic and hypoechoic context, increased pattern of vascularity, malignant may be suspected. So if it's enlarged, there is absence of the echogenic hilum, there is thickening of uh, the hyperechoic rim and the distortion, okay? And then when you apply your color, you are also seeing increased vascularity and you are also seeing other distortions and it may also be abnormally enlarged. Start thinking of malignance. Again, it's not your duty to say there is malignance. You can give your differentials there and recommend for FNA or a biopsy to be done so that you can have specific diagnosis that may come into play. This is an epitrochlear lymphadenopathy. Uh, you can see here that uh, we still have that echogenic central hilum, and uh, you also have uh, hypoechoic uh, appearance there. And then we still have, it still maintains that uh, hyperechogenic rim. And this was within the medial aspect of the elbow that may appear. Um, you also have color. You can see that we are only having color around uh, that. You can see here that uh, the central hilum is it's, it's distorted. It's somehow distorted. It's not as clear as it should be because we need to have that echogenic appearance that may play there, but it's not there. Uh, the, the, the surrounding borders, they are maintained, but they are not specific. Um, so that was my presentation. I hope people have not slept. You are too quiet. And uh, I will end my presentation from here. Thank you so much for your attention. What is the take home message? The take home message is that when you are dealing with an elbow ultrasound, understand your anatomy. Once you understand your anatomy, be systematic. Scan your anterior compartment scan your medial compartment, scan your lateral compartment, do your posterior compartment, and no specific structures that you are looking for. No specific abnormalities that may come into play. And the other thing that you also must understand is that there are two major things that you need to know about the elbow joint. Know each part that stabilizes the joint, and there are only two collateral ligament. The ulnar collateral ligament, which is in the middle, and the radio collateral ligament. Please assess those. Go to the posterior part, check the ocranion and its, and its relationship with the, the bursa. Come to the anterior aspect, check for the nerves, check for the brachial artery, check their insertion. Come to the lateral portion. Understand also that one of the aspects of the elbow joint is that it has to control the flexion and the extension. And this is where the common extensor tendon comes in. And this is also where the, the common flexor tendon comes in. And this is very important also to understand so that, that you get to know exactly what you are looking for. So thank you so much for your attention and have a good night. Those were my references. Uh, there were just two. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. At this juncture, I will hand over to the Secretary General so that uh, we can know what next. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Mulenga, for that wonderful presentation. We've learned a lot, actually. Um, and one clear message that you've spoken about is we should make sure we remember and know our anatomy. Um, so I'll just uh, leave it to the audience. For anyone who's got questions, just raise your hands or you can unmute your mic and go ahead and ask your question or if you have a contribution. 
you can go ahead. Hello. Hello. Can yeah, go I... ahead. Yes, Thank you, you can go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been a wonderful presentation. Uh, my name is Ansama Mitale, Solways General. I, I have two questions for the presenter. I should say this was so informative. My, my brain was almost bursting because of too much information. I think it's a, it's a lot of work to do. My question is, the, uh, we, ha we have had the cases where maybe someone had an injury to the elbow joint and then it locks. Someone can't extend and the, maybe they had a fracture. I'll, I'll ask in two ways, where someone just has a locked elbow they can't uh, flex their, their, their elbow. What are we supposed to look for? And the second one is the, maybe someone had a POP, which uh, was there for, for quite some time. And then upon removal, they find that the patient, the patient can't extend their, their elbow joint. Are there any specific areas we are supposed to look at? Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll quickly respond to your answer. Uh, the question that he has actually asked, it's a very important question. And uh, in, in my, I've been collecting some cases and it, it has revealed a lot about some of the, the, the things clinicians are doing. Okay, not really doing, but complications. Half the time you put a POP uh, and the patient will end up having this uh, deformity, yet it was corrected. But to answer your question, when a patient comes with a flexed elbow, if I got you right, right? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yes. So remember, remember, sonographically and anatomically, we've got one structure that helps the elbow to flex, and it's a common flexor tendon and a common extensor tendon. So you have to go to your, this, this bone, this elbow, which is coming, it's in the flexed position. So go to your lateral portion. Don't even waste time. However, I should warn you, you may not correct exactly the problem, but remember that you've got the common extensor tendon. So this may have been compromised either by a POP or it was injury and it healed and the patient may not open. Also don't work as an individual, rehearse, rehearse with the, the physiotherapy department, but as a sonographer, emphasize so much on the, on, the, on the lateral portion because this is where you have the common extensor tendon. And this common extensor tendon, it has got other components again that you need to understand as a complexity. So give a view, you may pick something there may be a lesion, there may be some fibrosis, there may be necrosis, there may be inflammatory process that has happened there. So go for the, the lateral portion because that's where you have the common extensor tendon. And then for the POP, uh, I think people who have been practicing, they also help me to understand this. POP, sometimes the way they are put, they may also affect the, the joint space depending on how it is put. I believe orthopedic surgeons have to ensure that the soft tissue that are involved, they are all preserved. But I've seen a POP, somebody is just removing the POP, you check the cranion or the posterior compartment, there is fluid around the, 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 the bus just behind there. And you comment on that. Others, they actually tend to have chronic inflammation in there and it will affect the ligaments that joins the cranion process. So I've experienced what you are saying, and I don't know what others have experienced, but as a sonographer, go for specific things with reasoning. I hope I've, I've tried to ask one or to answer one or two things. Thank you so much. You've been so helpful. Thank you so much. And I, I, I also know there are people who are practicing in musculoskeletal ultrasound. They can also give their experience and what they are, they are, they are seeing so that we can learn on the other side on what's going on.
Okay, we, we Madam can... Trinus, you can unmute your mic and go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Simlena, for, uh, for the presentation. It was well informative. I have a question. Um, I don't know if I missed it because my network was so shaky. Uh, we've seen so many cases of, um, especially in pediatrics, uh, of trauma whereby an x ray is showing that uh, there, there is no fracture, but the, the elbow is swollen. You, you spoke about the fat pet the fat pad um, being distorted. Yes, um, yes, yes. Do you, do you happen to have ultrasound images to show the appearances, um, the, the ultrasound features of that? I don't know I if you show, I, you, no, I, you, if they were no, in your presentation or I missed them. I know in my presentation, it was not there, but I can always, before I share, I think I, I have some images which shows exactly the normal fat pad and uh, the displaced one. I think I, I have one or two images, but in this presentation, I did not include it, but I, it's mm -hmm. noted. Mm -hmm. And then okay. uh, personally, I, I, I don't enjoy so much pediatrics because sometimes you have to use modified <laughs> way, things have not developed. So I'm not a fan of pediatrics at <laughs> times. So, but I've, I've I've taken note of your of your of your request, and I'll I'll include it. Okay, thank you so much. If you could maybe share okay. them even on the WhatsApp group. No problem. To, to I'll, I'll email, definitely do that. Email the presentation. No problem. I'll do that. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Trinus, for that question. Um, Mr. Mwansa, you can go ahead. Thank you so much, Mr. Cuthbert, for that wonderful and well prepared presentation. I've got two questions. There were some slides that talked about um, bursitis. I think there was a blue one with a lot of uh, effusion there. So maybe my question is, how can you differentiate that one from a cyst? And also the other question is, uh, one of our colleagues uh, talked about the locked elbow. So um, my thinking is that... Uh, yes, you can go ahead, I'm, I'm listening. Okay, that one, yes. My, my thinking is that, could it be an injury to the nerve? And if, uh, and if yes, how can you evaluate that there's maybe some disruption that has occurred with the nerve? How can you appreciate that on ultrasound? So those are my, my two questions. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think the questions are clear. Uh, the first one, he, his question is, how can you differentiate this bursitis from, from a cyst? I think common, the common, the common knowledge that should come into play as sonographers is that we know what a cyst is. It's a fluid filled uh, lesion that we may see. And it has got specific criteria when you say this is a cyst and this is not a cyst. I will still emphasize anatomical location is key. 